Hello, everybody. Welcome to New 302. Uh, and welcome to November the 19th, Thursday, November the 19th, um, which is, let me think, one of the three final classes for the semester, if you can believe that. So we're closing in fairly rapidly on the halfway point, as astounding as that is. Uh, but as I told you, time, it's a funny thing. Um, I hope everybody had uh, a reasonably uh, restful and recuperative um, reading week over the past week. Um, yeah, I hope that uh, if you didn't get a chance to take strict downtime, at the very least, you got a chance to get a bit caught up. But honestly, I'm sort of hoping that uh, uh, that you had the opportunity for both. Um, so yeah, I hope it was regenerative, uh, weirdly close, as I've mentioned a number of times to the end of the semester. Um, but uh, I don't know, it's not bad getting a few, you know, getting a gap and then it's a few weeks and then done exams and then it's the holidays. So, um, uh, such as they are in this strange year, but I imagine it'll still be kind of nice. Uh, I have noticed that we are uh, steadily steering towards a transition. I have now spotted snow outside my window, not once, but several times. Um, yeah, so, so here we go. We're coming into fall. All right. There are a few things today. Okay, so there are not one, but two student presentations um, in the offing today. Uh, and so I, again, I'm going to um, follow this pattern where I uh, reduce my recording accordingly um, so that you're not being sort of overloaded. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep this to, uh, you know, uh, well, we'll see what happens. I may, I may do this one for an hour and then another one for half an hour or something like that or um, maybe I'll do two for 40 minutes. That's also a possibility. I think that's what I'll do. So <clears throat> if you'll allow me to do, okay. Okay, there we go, 40 minutes. Um, so the topic for this week is um, the death of the hero. And this is something that we've already touched on to some extent. Um, the one text, uh, of course, uh, presumably you've already read uh, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, but uh, I would nevertheless encourage you to go back and take a look at the specific passage, um, uh, the, the Siegfried dream. Uh, I don't have a page reference for you right off the top, but uh, you know approximately where it is. This is this, this dream where Jung fires the rifle at the German culture hero, uh, Siegfried, who is a dragon slayer. Uh, um, so that is the, that's the reading. We've talked a little bit about this already uh, in connection to um, the hero's journey and the need to, in some sense, transition uh, as one moves through uh, their life away from the heroic energy. So the heroic energy has this time and place. Um, it's very good for getting people launched, right? So a failure to connect with the heroic energy at, at some level, um, I think in one's youth, uh, can can lead to problems. And, you know, what the ethos of heroism is, is, you know, uh, broadly construable, right? Different people are capable of being heroes in a great number of different ways. Um, and it isn't just, of course, about, you know, whatever, um, explicit and altruistic, you know, savior behavior, uh, also the name of my next album. Um, uh, it's not so much just about that. I mean, the heroic energy is about you know, meeting, meeting your goals and conquering them, whatever that may be. So it is the case, um, as we've talked about a fair bit in, in Thursday night discussions, that there is a real skew in the modern, um, the modern ethos uh, around this stuff, right? Um, towards being a, a doer. So that is partly reflected in the sort of general social bias away from extroversion, which to some extent I think is sort of genetically inborn for the population, but is also reinforced by questions of culture. Um, so our culture is, despite its um, great attachment to individuality and rebellion, um, and if, if you think about the number of narratives and things that are rebel narratives, it's quite remarkable. Um, that we, that we glorify our rebels uh, in theory, if not in practice. Um, and, uh, you know, the, we have this individuality and we have this, um, uh, this sort of rebellion stance. 
Uh, and yet, uh, at the same time, we are not a culture by and large in the West that especially um, privileges or focuses on um, sort of introversion. Uh, and so, you know, I would contend as, as I have done that there are substantially heroic things to be done in inner work. Uh, and indeed you obviously can see the conjunctions of that with both Jung and Campbell. So um, in general though, right, that pattern, the pattern of mustering one's energy to you know, put some kind of mark on the world and to become something, right? To lift oneself into the state of protagonism is sort of central to Thoreauic ethos. And, you know, you have to, at some level, you know, get pumped up, right? So, so this is the, the classic balance line on inflation. You don't want the energy, right? The newfound energy that's surging out of the, the self to be, um, uh, over identified with and thus right for the for the ego to attempt to commandeer that energy um, you don't want to over identify with it because then you decide that you're the reborn messiah and you start acting highly erratically and at the very least um, you're kind of conceited and often irritating uh, although the likelihood that you may attract a cult is not zero um, so, you know, you can get sort of surge filled with that energy. Um, but the other option, of course, is that it can leak away with no conscious involvement, no ego involvement at all. Um, and that's not so good either. Um, you want to be able to, to carry a certain amount of steam, right? And there is an important middle road here, um, balanced road between these questions of sort of unhealthy degrees of you know, narcissism, for instance, and like, you know, health, healthy forms of selfishness and self-orientation and learning how to balance those things. So, um, so you want a certain amount of energy in your life, uh, feeling like you are passive and at the whims of other people or that other people are making your decisions or that you're just going through the numbers or any of these things uh, leads people to states of intense dissatisfaction and meaninglessness. Um, and uh, it can be hard enough to um, learn how to produce one's own meaning and how to find meaning in the world without uh, thus additionally sort of subsuming oneself to, uh, to the collective or to, you know, any number of other um, sort of exterior forces, right? So it's good to have a head of steam, but, but it's not the only archetypal force for one thing. And um, it's also at a certain point in life, you know, stops being appropriate in some way. We do not want to see the same kind of behaviors in many ways from 50 year olds or 60 year olds or 70 year olds as we do from 20 year olds, right? People who are 70 and are still strutting like the conquering hero, um, generally speaking, there's an adaptation issue here. Now that doesn't mean you can't be energetic, you can't be lively, you can't be creative, you can't be playful, you can't be all those things. Of course you can, um, but it's, sort of odd, um, or we would typically think of it as odd, uh, for somebody to be like 75 and burning with ambition, right? F to be 75 and be, you know, um, let's say, um, deep, deeply invested in sexual conquest, right? There are such people, but, but typically we think of that as being a bit odd, not that older people don't have sex, but like, I mean, like, you know, on the chase, on the make, right? That would be considered odd. Um, likewise, you know, there comes a point at which a, f a sort of inability to relinquish power at a certain age um, itself becomes pathological. I mean, that's in part what sort of King Lear is about, right? Um, so in, in Shakespeare's King Lear, uh, he's extremely susceptible to flattery and he won't let go of the reins of power. Like you just won't, won't relinquish it. And this is something that you see in, you know, symbolically and, and then actually in uh, clinical work quite a bit. Uh, you see it in family dynamics where there, you know, there's a, um, a competitive aspect. Uh, you know, the mother competes with the daughter, daughter or the father competes with the son. Uh, and so then there's a, there's a discounting of the upcoming generation and there's this funny rupture. And uh, in some cases you see it quite dramatically. I knew somebody whose uh, mother fairly routinely used to attempt to seduce her partners, right? Uh, and 
that usually elicits gasps from the room when you say it, but generally speaking, you know, if you got 30 people in a room and it's mostly gas, you'll get one or two people nodding vigorously. So it's relatively, you know, it's common enough that people encounter this, this kind of like competitive mother daughter or father son kind of behavior. Less often does it cross uh, over, right? For reasons that we've already discussed. But, you know, there comes a time when when in theory, you know, age and maturity means that you are supposed to be stepping into a, a different role. And we've talked about that in, in uh, a few places already, but that shift towards the existential and the reflective uh, doesn't mean you can't do things, doesn't mean you can't get things done, doesn't mean you can't have interest, doesn't mean you can't be energetic, doesn't mean any of that stuff. Um, but it does mean that, you know, continuing to see yourself as the fresh and conquering hero becomes unseemly over time becomes unseemly, uh, which is to say that it seems like a little bit, uh, a little bit past its due date, right? We worry. There's something about that state of mind that strikes us all as being, you know, stagnant, stulted um, in, in important ways. So, you know, Jung gets at this to some extent in his Siegfried dream. Um, and it's more than that, because what else is he blowing away in that dream? Well, he's blowing away the, the blonde German dragon slaying culture hero. Uh, and, you know, the fact that this dream coincides in some way with his sort of fall from grace with the psychoanalytic community is, I suspect, not at all coincidental. Um, so, uh, yeah. The other thing, of course, is, as we've talked about, our our culture has made a, an, an overall, a collective move towards a certain kind of deconstruction of the hero. And um, that is why the, the reading for the week is Watchmen. Um, now, I'm actually not going to say that much about Watchmen today. I will release a lecture on Watchmen next week. And the reason is, for one thing, I don't want to step on the toes of the two presenters, um, depending on where their, their coverage lands on that. Um, but also what it means is that I can select my remarks specifically to fill spaces after their commentary. Um, and that's important because to be totally honest, I could say uh, so much, I could say so much about, about Watchmen. Um, so, uh, and, and indeed, as you'll see, I will. <laughs> I'll give it at least an hour. Um, but I'll try to fill out some of the um, sort of features and things in the book. The book is so rich and so dense, uh, honestly, that it, it would be virtually impossible for uh, us to exhaust the material if we did a whole course on it. Um, on that note, I am going to say a couple of things about Watchmen quickly. We're just not going to get into deep analysis, but I want to point you guys towards some resources. So. I first read Watchmen um, in grade eight, when I was in grade eight. Uh, grade eight? Yeah, grade eight. And I used to watch a show that was on TVO, TV Ontario, um, which was um, sort of a, a passion project by the a Canadian comedian Rick Green, um, uh, who yeah, was on the Red Green show, if any of you ever saw that. Not likely of your own accord, but possibly if a parent or grandparent was watching it. Um, I didn't, I didn't love that show, to be honest, uh, although I, I met some of the principals, including Rick Green, uh, interestingly enough, at a, a history dinner years later, but that's another story. So, um, so we had the show, and the show was called Prisoners of Gravity, and Prisoners of Gravity was a weekly half-hour TVO series, um, which was a, a, an oddball. I didn't really, I'd never seen anything like it, really, on television before, and remember that TVO is, is public television, right? So it's non-commercial. Um, which means that it produces sort of, you know, often strange little little things because it's on the public dime. They do lots of, you know, educational literature-based programming and um, they ask for pledges and, um, you know, they rerun old episodes of Doctor Who where they used to. Um, you know, so they do, they do unusual kinds of stuff like that. But Prisoners of Gravity, this Rick Green show, was a half-hour show and the frame premise of the series um, was that Rick had uh, attempted to escape the earth by building himself a rocket car 
um, although this was not a primary show of fiction, and had crashed into a satellite, uh, which apparently was habitable, um, and was up there but could uh, sort of hack into television feeds around the world. So every week he would hack into a TV show that was about fishing or something. Uh, and then he would spend the half an hour doing um, a thematic episode interview show on science fiction fantasy and comics uh, to some extent movies and stuff but really it was about science fiction fantasy and comics um and uh, i think it ran for three seasons um you can catch episodes of it uh including the episode i'm going to reference you can catch episodes of it i'm sure on youtube it's been floating around for years um it is a, a grainy lo-fi quality but honestly you're you're not watching it for the striking visuals for the most part um but for the period which was the early 90s yeah the early 90s um this show did uh, interviews with an enormous number of uh, prominent um uh, people in the industry at the time. And I watched the show quite regularly because um, I was, was, <laughs> was, because uh, I am a geek. Um, so I watched the show quite regularly. It was full of things that I like. I, I made uh, some of my current friends, in fact, through our shared love of that show. Um, and then one day they aired an episode which was just totally unlike anything else I'd seen. So normally these episodes were thematic, you know, they might do an episode on I don't know, robots in fiction, or they might do an episode on vampires or something. They might do an episode on, you know, uh, the new wave movement in science fiction in the 1970s, whatever, and interview lots of people and cut it together thematically. Interesting stuff. But then they had this episode, and the entire episode was dedicated to a comic. And that threw me. I read comics, but, uh, you know, I was young enough and in a small enough town that I had never heard of this particular comic. And the comic in question was Watchmen. I mean, 12 comics if you want to get technical about it, but you never find it in individual issues anymore. So Watchmen dropped um, with a pretty big splash in 1986. It was a fairly immediate sensation, published by DC, written by Alan Moore, uh, and uh, drawn by Dave Gibbons. And it is on your reading list. And for those of you who have read it, bravo, reread it. For those of you who have not yet read it, you should really read it. The book, with justification, made Time Life's top 100 novels of the 20th century list. It is a, a really remarkable text of its, of its period. And the thing that, of course, gets, gets people you know, away from it typically is that the assumption is that it is a, a superhero comic book. And nominally speaking, it is. That is to say that it sort of plays in that territory. But what it does with that territory um, is considerably more rich in a literary sense, uh, vastly more thematically complex than what you might normally think of as, as a, a comic if you don't read this kind of thing, uh, and really served as a signature text, okay, for the deconstruction of the, the superhero, okay, um, and looking at the superhero. So, you know, if you want to give an easy answer. The question is sort of like, what would it be like if superheroes were real? Is the basic question. Now this comic came about, wait, I don't want to say too much. <laughs> I don't want to say too much. I'm saving this. I'm saving this for the lecture next week. Okay, I won't say too much about Watchmen, except read Watchmen. Um, yeah, so I watched this whole episode on on Watchmen, on Prisoners of Gravity. And if I can, I'll find the link and, and post it up. You can watch the episode yourself. Um, if you've only seen the movie for Watchmen, watch the comic. I don't think I have to say this, but but often I do. It's, it's a fine visual adaptation, but not a particularly good adaptation otherwise, as most movies are not of books, to be frank, right? They're an adequate snacky substitute, um, but, but not really, you know, they're not typically good translations. So, um, so I watched this episode and, and uh, it, it absolutely, absolutely entranced me. I was sort of at the right age um, for one thing. Uh, and so I immediately went and special ordered this thing and it arrived. And then I proceeded to basically like do nothing but read that. I stayed up and didn't do my homework and I didn't sleep. Like I stayed up astoundingly late. And like many people and certainly like the entire comics industry, it had a huge impact on me. So I would encourage you, go go read Watchmen. I will make my remarks about it next week. People are going to talk about it tonight. But there are extremely rich archetypal themes. Alan Moore, the author in question, 
knows what he's doing. He's a skilled writer. In 86, he had really come into his powers. Since then, he does um, all sorts of different work, some of which I'm going to show you shortly. Um, so since then, he's done all sorts of different work, but he has a keen and erudite sense of archetypal dynamics. And he puts those to work in his writing quite deftly. Uh, and in Watchmen, it's on full display and is, you know, as is sometimes the case, it's, it's a, a piece of work that really broke in a seminal way um, and influenced what has happened in comics and, um, uh, and in sort of the, the, the fiction around comics for, you know, for the entire intervening period, basically, you know, for the, the 35 years since. Um, and that's a big deal, okay, because in many ways, comic book heroes and comic book authors have known this for a while, but it's finally filtering to the public with a massive splash of comic book movies everywhere. Um, comic books are um, one of the closest things we have to a modern mythology that's archetypally influenced, right? Now, everything is archetypally influenced. I don't know how many different ways I can underline that. It's all archetypal, but with comic books, it's really splashed out there like classic myths. And of course, it's not that people don't connect to you know, original mythology, but the fact is that most you know, kids today or something do not get the same kind of charge, frankly, um, you know, out of you know, reading Celtic myths or Viking myths or something, myths in those forms, as they do in watching those things be you know, dramatized into the adventures of Thor and Green Lantern. And so it, it's this powerful projective space for us and one of the things that Watchmen does so powerfully within that space is challenge us. It holds a mirror up to the space, which then holds a mirror up to us. So I don't want to say too much more because like I said, next week, but I did want to make a few recommendations. If you've already read Watchmen, read it again. If you've already read Watchmen again, <clears throat> there are a few other things I will recommend. So one, if you like Alan Moore uh, and you like the hero deconstruction, but you're looking for something that's got more teeth, more substance, I highly recommend Alan Moore's Promethea. Promethea. This was released in 32 issues. I came across it nearly by accident uh, when I was living in England um, a number of years ago and stumbled across some bound volumes and was like, oh my God. Um, Promethea, nominally speaking, you know, it, in, in its appearances, it appears to be a relatively conventional comic book story at the start. And it is about sort of Alan Moore's version of Wonder Woman, basically. This is Promethea here. But right off the bat, the themes that Alan, Alan Moore is working with um, promptly begin to subvert that. And what seems like a fairly typical comic book story instead becomes a crash course in um, Western esoteric archetypology and to a certain extent sort of esoteric uh, theory. So across uh, these beautiful 20th anniversary editions, I have several different editions, but these particular ones, unfortunately, they have not yet released. I believe COVID delayed the printing of volume three. You can see this is book one. So book three of this, um, which is unfortunate because these are great. Uh, as hardcovers, but you can get it in a bunch of different editions. It's, um, it's a really quite beautiful um, book. And, um, you know, among other things, for instance, it has, well, just to give you an idea of how much this is not a regular comic book story. Uh, you know, it has an entire issue, which is Promethea explicating page by page, and thus Alan Moore explicating page by page, his interpretation of the tarot. Okay, so all the major arcana of the tarot card by card. Now that's embedded in some things that have to do with plot, but like literally, look, these pages, these are not pages of people punching each other through walls. These is, are pages of Alan Moore's proxy Wonder Woman flying through uh, imagination dimensions of symbolism and the unconscious in order to attempt to understand the meaning of, you know, uh, esoteric systems that go back uh, at least a couple of thousand years. So if you like comics, if you read comics, I recommend it. Okay, two. I bring this one up because, weirdly, I woke up at 5 a.m. today. Uh, that wasn't weird. I got up to, <clears throat> to continue marking, and I'm making excellent headway. Um, but, uh, uh, but I got up at 5 a.m., and 
Um, when I got up, I still had a dream pretty fresh in my mind. Um, yeah, which was an unusual one. So I dreamt about this character, um, a comic book character actually, uh, named uh, Rebus, okay? Um, Rebus is from uh, a comic um, called Doom Patrol, written by Grant Morrison. Um, Grant Morrison is sort of widely considered to be um, uh, the other esoteric comic book writer that is at approximately the same level as Alan Moore. Some people would place him in inferior in the inferior. I think that they do slightly different things. Um, but his character Rebus is an alchemical mystical hermaphrodite. And in the process of Grant Morrison's run on Doom Patrol, uh, Rebus goes through a whole set of alchemical transformations, dramatized, of course, but actually with surprisingly deep symbolic um, import as Rebus is already read off the bat as a Mr. Hermaphrodite is a combination of two other characters and the negative spirit. Um, it contains ample references to uh, the spirit in the bottle. So for those of you that are looking to, to get additional sort of thinking about that stuff, um, generally the comic itself is, it's a superhero comic, but it's a surrealist superhero comic. So it's a pretty mind bending romp. Um, the entirety of the Grant Morrison run uh, can be purchased as a single omnibus volume. Uh, this is the sort of thing that you can fairly easily knock a burglar out with. Uh, if you take a quick look at this cover, this gives you a fairly good idea of the <laughs> uh, general level of surrealism, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's, um, you know, not everybody's taste, I imagine. But again, if you like comics and you're interested in archetypal dynamics and it's a fairly thrilling kind of romp uh, and plus, it's got this character, Rebus. There was a recent TV show. It's actually a pretty good adaptation, but again, an adaptation is only an adaptation. So, um, oh yeah, so the uh, uh, the dream I had was uh, Rebus. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, that's, that's Rebus uh, there. They dress sort of a bit like a mummy, um, or not even a bit, like a mummy. Uh, so I dreamt that Rebus from Doom Patrol, this alchemical mystical hermaphrodite, was discussing the integration of their masculine side by talking about punk anger. Uh, and the way that punk anger was exemplified within my dream was by um, the bad religion song Infected. Um, and this played, and then I, I woke up. I uh, had a series of sort of, um, I took a brief nap around 10 and had uh, a series of like false awakening, you know, nested dreams. And this is particularly interesting to me because when I snap back out, Rebus has this whole recursive passage about Matroshka, right? Russian dolls within dolls within dolls. Um, anyway, long story short, I had that a little bit on my brain, but if you like Watchmen and the deconstruction that occurs there, I recommend Promethea, I recommend Doom Patrol. If you do not like comics, if it is the case that comics are not your thing, or that you just find them a bit difficult to parse, I recommend, and bear in mind, there are lots of things that are not superhero comics. I mean, in some ways my tastes are pretty weird and in some ways my tastes are relatively traditional. Um, you know, but certainly there are lots and lots of things. If you've never read Mouse, uh, M-A-U-S, the comic book won a Pulitzer Prize. There's a reason it is um, a funny animal book, which is to say that it's told with little animals about, a son's relationship to his father and the father's experience of the Holocaust. So it's pretty heavy stuff, except they're all drawn as mice, right? Um, let me think. Other books that I would highly recommend. Persepolis, uh, a totally non-supers book, which is about um, uh, uh, Iran and the Shah and sort of life for people leaving Iran. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Black Hole, which is a disturbing um, comic. It is not, uh, again, a supers comic book. It's disturbing, but quite interesting. Anyway, the list goes on and on. There's lots of, frankly, quite interesting work. Um, these things very often will be referred to if you just come across them as graphic novels, a term that I object to very deeply because it seems like it's, um, um, it seems vaguely ashamed to me and I've never understood. It's like, it's, it's comic. What's the problem? I read what I read. Um, this is the uh, sort of feeling I have when people occasionally critique my use of, um, you know, like expletives, foul language. And it's like, I don't 
have anything to prove. <laughs> my, vocab my vocabulary is plenty wide ranging, but sometimes an F-bomb is what you want. Plus, you know, empirically shown to reduce pain. If you hit your thumb with a hammer, it reduces pain. Okay, so if you're not much for comics or if you just want to get a much better sense of comics, I highly recommend Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. This is a classic in the field. Um, it is a, uh, a book of critical theory, essentially an artistic theory on comic books in the form of a comic book by Scott McCloud, which allows him to show you the effects, essentially speaking, right? So when he talks about something in terms of comic book art, he he can immediately exemplify it on the page, right? He can manipulate the medium as the medium is talking about itself. That also makes it a, a pretty, um, again, recursively trippy book, if you happen to like that kind of thing, and I do. Um, so yeah, it's a really, really um, excellent book. Um, and I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, and then, <clears throat> good. Um, I also add, I shouldn't have to add this, but I'm gonna add it anyway. If you have not read the three issues of um, Rare Bit Fiends that I put on, and if you could track it down, get other Rare Bit Fiends. They're just amazing. You're reading sections of people's, of his specifically, dream narratives, and they're fascinating, right? If you have connection with your own dream life, they take you into that space really immediately and directly. But the thing that's specifically interesting about the three volumes that I have selected on the text is that the author, who I was supposed to interview this month, and I totally forgot, uh, so I need to get in touch with him. Uh, I decided to reach out and have him on one of my YouTube shows. Um, so the the author, um, Rick Veitch, uh, you know, is is quite Jungian, um, in, increasingly so, in fact, and has sort of gotten deeper and deeper into sort of um, Jungian act of imagination and alchemy uh, in the last 20 years. Um, but the way that that stuff expresses for him, of course, has to do with sort of natural patterns in the world. And as he's going through these sets of transformations and stuff, he's been kind enough to draw it all into a comic, which, again, has certain advantages. So like, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Marshall McLuhan, right? The Canadian media, media theorist. And all of you have, I'm certain, at least heard at some point the phrase, the medium is the message, even if, you know, that was never clearly explained to you in one of your English or media classes, right? But like, what does that mean? Well, it means that any given medium, any given artistic or creative medium carries with it certain kinds of assumptions and certain kinds of effects. So one of my favorites, in this instance is talking about television. And this is uh, old school television. I actually don't know if it's true of modern televisions, but we're talking about like tube based TVs that were the standard of television until flat screens became dominant. Um, so tube based televisions have this particular strobe rate and this particular editing rate. And the way that TV is constructed is very interesting, right? Um, TV, of course, Film does this too, but TV all the more so is like uses lots of cuts, 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 lots of editing, right? It's very different than a stage play in that sense, if you really consider it. If you've taken a film course, you've learned to pay attention to cuts, right? Editing, cuts, shots, the way that things, right, effects, the way that things are organized in that way has been foregrounded for you so that it's, it's not just background and transparent. But if you've never done that, just like sit and watch a TV show at some point and or better yet watch an, an ad or a music video or something and like just track the cuts cut 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 and it's in a way fascinating that we all manage to sort of pick up the grammar of the medium sufficiently that we can stitch that back together on the fly if you were experiencing your actual you know perception in that way uh, i suspect you would find it highly disorienting now that that facility for stitching that stuff back together is itself, of course, based on our facility to stitch together our own sensorium, which again, like your eyes are cicating all over the place. You're getting things in snapshots. Your mind is constantly filling in sections of your environment because you're not actually seeing it, right? Blind spots and perceptual illusions and all that stuff. So your mind is already stitching lots of things together into this coherent thing. And that kind of gets bootstrapped in something like film. But if you step back and look at film or movie um, uh, or a TV show, music video ad, and just watch the cuts, right? You, you rapidly, it's a, it's a jarring thing that they very often do with early film classes. Um, 
One of the functions, however, of it, and this is the, the example that I find interesting, there's this book that I am fond of uh, called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by Jerry Mandler. Um, came out in the 70s. And Mandler was responding to the shift that had occurred in the medium. I'm coming back around to comics, I swear. Mandler was responding to the shift that had occurred uh, in the medium, which is in the late 1960s, a bunch of ad executives decided that um, they wanted to take the techniques that made advertising effective and redeploy those techniques into education, specifically children's education. Right? So rather than having kind of stuff they would use, edits and jingles and color and, and character and all this stuff, right? All the techniques that you would use for persuasion in a, in a sort of capitalist market, right? They were going to use for education. And those people went to work and you got Sesame Street. That's what Sesame Street is. Now, Sesame Street, of course, was in turn enormously, enormously influential. And the pace and density of television and kids television and stuff today is is much higher but um that was an early instance of that kind of thing and lots of people lauded it they were like oh finally tv you know can be doing something good in you know educating people which has always been the dream around it and mandler basically said no uh, it doesn't matter what kind of programming you put on TV because it has certain kinds of basic effects. And he liked to cite one particular experiment where you take a kid, you hook them up to an EEG, so you're measuring their brain waves, right? And the frequency of brain waves, roughly speaking, correlates, especially in the frontal lobe, correlates to um, sort of level of attention. So the higher the frequency, the higher the speed of the brain waves, the, the more attentive, up to a limit past that people are scattered and out of it. But, you know, up to a limit, right? And as they slow down, you drop into alpha state, you begin to dissociate, you drop into, right, deeper meditative or trance states, et cetera, et cetera. So what he did was, or what not he, he reported on this, but what they did was they took uh, kids and they hooked them up to an EEG and they hooked the EEG up to the television. And the idea was that if they managed to maintain their, their brain waves within the like moderate beta range, which is the range that we associate with focused attention, okay, then the TV would stay on. And if they're, if they're, Frequencies dropped below that, indicating that they had drifted into alpha, so a slightly dissociative, slightly trancey, frankly, slightly hypnotic -y state, uh, then the TV would turn off. And I think on average, the kids could keep the TV on for like 30 seconds, and it did not matter what kind of programming was on it. Now, I don't know if that experiment's been replicated, I'll be frank. Uh, and I certainly don't know if it's been replicated recently, and I don't know to what extent this is an effect of the technology of the television as opposed, right? So I don't know if it applies to projectors and flat screen TVs and stuff. But, you know, pretty much every parent or caregiver in the world knows that you can use television to hypnotize a child. That's what it's for, right? I was strongly opposed to the use of TV with kids because I, I grew up on a ton of TV and movies, but when I was about 15 or so, I basically stopped watching TV. Uh, I still watched movies because movies, but, uh, but I stopped watching TV and my family watched a lot of TV, like a lot. Um, uh, yeah, especially my dad watched like a lot of TV and still watches a lot of TV. So I stopped watching TV and just started kind of reading and listening to music most of the time, which were things I did anyway, but, um, but I really emphasized it. And, you know, sometime in my early twenties, I, uh, you know, still held this position. I was like, oh, I'm not going to use the hypno box if I have kids. But during the, the period of time where I was looking after my nieces, uh, when my sister went back to school and needed some help, I looked after my nieces and they were at the time, la 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 la, six and two or thereabouts, five and one, five and one. Yeah. Uh, no, six and two, six and two for sure. Yeah. Um, and I fell prey to the television thing as quickly as anybody else, uh, which is like, like if I needed a break or I needed to prep dinner or I needed to do whatever, as often as not, I'd be like, here, you can watch a show and then book, put it on and uh, right. Watch the nieces go into a, an alpha state while the box reprogrammed their brain. Okay. What's my point here? Mandler has these four arguments for the elimination of television. And one of them is just like, it does not matter what the content is right? The medium itself has these properties, these right hypnotic -y properties, and that raises some real questions. It's like, do we, is this a thing that we want to do? Okay. And some of it is a function of the cuts and we can get into that. So every medium has certain kinds of properties. Comic books have been frankly crapped on for a long time, right? They've gone from comic strips and there are some predecessors, the one panel comic, right? 
Um, and there are arguments to be made that in fact, in some ways, uh, comic books go, go back really far. You know, the, the Bayou Tapestry, um, for instance, is kind of, right? It's like this long scroll with stuff on it. I mean, we've been doing visual depictions in sequential form for a long time. But unlike film and unlike prose, comic books these days do one thing and they do it especially, especially well. They do the conjunction of image and the written word. No other medium does this in the same way, okay? Yes, you get some written words and things like video games, but it's, it's not really the same. And yes, of course, you can have text in a movie, but it's always intrusive. You know, you get that like thing at the start that says it is the 22nd century cucumbers rule the earth right and it's like okay okay i get it you're dumping exposition on me like get to the thing but there are things that specifically can occur in comic that do not occur in other media okay so you can have a kind of simultaneity and you have time control right the way that you do with prose right you read prose you are controlling the pace you can flip forward you can flip back you can run the scenes etc you can't really do that with a film. I mean, you can deliberately, but the point is that you don't experience it naturally in that way. Whereas with a comic, your eyes are wandering around. You're taking in details here and there. You can have a disjunct, right? Like a voiceover between the text and the word. So there can be a juxtaposition, which is reinforcing or which emphasizes different things, right? This is very important. Um, you have really interestingly compared to something like film, what's called the gutter. The gutter is the gap between panels, okay? So if you take a look, okay, Watchmen is a great example because it's mostly laid in a standard nine panel. It's very regular, okay? And that has cert certain effects. You have a standard nine panel like this and it's like a metronomic beat, boom, 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 right? Whereas if you suddenly have uh, something like this, <laughs> oh, Right, it, it pops in this huge way. Anyway, never mind that for a second. Um, the point is, okay, if you look at a regular nine panel, like so, you are inferring the, the transition between each of these panels. They can visually echo each other. They can form an image across the page. There can be repeated motifs, etc. But every time there's a jump, you're the one that jumps the gutter. Your mind fills these details in. It stitches things together. That's important. That particular combination, okay, oh, see, I'm about to go over time. Okay, so that particular combination of factors serves to make the comic book unique. There are things that it can do that other media cannot do. And this is the really key thing, okay? This is why I'm saying it's like, whatever, you can call it a comic book or call it a graphic novel or call it sequential art, um, sequential narrative art. You can call it whatever you want. But the point is that each medium Okay, when we're talking about narrative media, each medium has its own unique abilities. Now there's been a lot of trade back and forth, okay, between comics and film. First, okay, comics borrowed extensively from film. Citizen Kane, for instance, the Orson Welles film ended up having a big influence on comics. Uh, if you've ever read the um, Michael Chabon novel, uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, it touches on that quite directly, but it's something of a historical point, okay? That, that film uh, had this impact where comic books started to like lay stuff out like film shots. They started using that kind of mentality, right? Um, and then more recently, comics have begun to have this enormous impact on film, right? So... Uh, I mean, it seems at this point like they're digging up every possible comic book property, and that has as much to do with Hollywood Moneyball as it does with anything, and that's a subject for another day. But the point is, there are also certain kinds of conventions and things that are naturalized to the comic book that are being imported to the screen, and some of them translate and some of them don't, frankly. Um, they're getting better at figuring out how to do it. They're getting better at figuring out how to make a reasonable translation between the two things. But what that tells you, the fact that that translation can be off and the fact that it can omit things tells you that there is a unique grammar and a unique set of capacities present within comics as a storytelling medium. And in some ways, perhaps, especially importantly for our purposes, our subject matter, when we're detailing the kind of stuff we're talking about in the course, this particular conjunction between image and word 
okay? And between like taking in images in a relatively right brain holistic -y way and taking words in in a relatively featural left brainy way and having to combine those things together is it requires ongoing interpretation, all media do, but it requires ongoing interpretation in a specific kind of way that serves often, in my opinion, as quite good training for the integration of kind of conscious and unconscious streams, right? The, like dis discursive rational thought together with imagistic moments. And that's a big part of the game when you're trying to get the content from the unconscious talking constructively with the conscious. You have to be able to translate, you have to be able to link things together. Um, and it's no wonder that comics have basically always been this hotbed for highly archetypal material, far more so than, than prose, far more so, right? Um, I suspect that no small part of that is due to the actual features of the medium, okay? So, Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that for now because <clears throat> my alarm already went off, but uh, that was my, my brief opening disquisition on comic books as a medium. I do encourage you to go read a bunch of those things, at the very least read the things that are on the syllabus. Um, and uh, yes, and I will withhold the rest of my Watchmen comments uh, until next week so that people get a chance to present and then I can present around that. There's so much good stuff to talk about. Okay, uh, for this second chunk of lecture, I will be uh, actually going through some essay writing uh, stuff, some essay writing advice. So um, yeah, I'll see you there.